Yeah, so we're here today. In the garden. We're going to sing it. And then we're going to talk about it. Like we always do with a hymn. This is like our 50th hymn. Really? We've been doing this for like a year and a half. Did you ever get an answer about the one that you asked us about? You asked us about one. I got one person who said they didn't recognize it. I was I was going to say that I also didn't recognize it, but I didn't know that I <laughs> mattered. <laughs> no, I'm the only one that seems like one. I don't know anything. Yeah, this is a fairly long one. To is uh, Jimbo Hill. Jesus is my boyfriend, orthodoxy song. Jesus is my uh, boyfriend. <laughs> this is very much a Jimbo from back in the early 1900s. Uh, 
I mean, you just read this, and I mean, it, it sounds like you're singing about. You could easily. It could easily be a girl singing about her boyfriend. Right? Uh, oh my goodness! You're like, except for the Son of God. Yeah, I mean, even that. I mean, like, I hear the voice of God telling me. Technically, about, I have to. Yeah. I mean, uh, anyway, but I, I mean, it's one of those that I that I like. That's a good gym over once in a while. Isn't isn't too bad for this one. Uh, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. Uh, point? Meaning? God's talking to me as I spend time with Him. God is communicating. Yeah. Not the greatest theology in the world, but so be it. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I don't actually know what tarry means. Hang around. Time. Hang around. As we linger. Loiter. Yeah. So what's, what's the writer saying? I did the last one. Uh, a lot of joy comes from walking and talking with God and knowing that he is his own. Yeah. Uh, does God walk with you and talk with you? This is the question. Um, the third version. Uh, I think it's more not like, like Enoch, but he still talks to us. <laughs> I think it's more like a, a sort of. How does he talk to us? Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit talk to us? Not with English. Huh? Through the way we feel. The Holy Word. I'm going here. This this is how the Holy Spirit talks to us. But also through our conscience. He uses other believers to speak the truth to us. It's it still comes from the Bible, but yeah, okay. he does like directly use other people. Because otherwise why are we doing what we're doing right now today? He's speaking to us through you as you're teaching us about Revelation. Gotcha, okay. I'm, I'm with you now. It's the, question of, the, the question of how, in what sense are we talking about? Is, is what I'm talking about. The, the, God speaks to us through other believers. Does that, today, does that mean that we're saying that God gives specific special messages to other believers to give to other people? No, or does, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and most, of, I think everybody here is a cessationist or, or doesn't believe that the miracle gifts are still going on. Uh, we would all say no, it doesn't do that. Uh, it's it's in a kind of more of a metaphorical sense or a symbolic sense. We say he talks with, in the same way that he's sovereign over everything and all truth that is true comes from him ultimately. So, in that sense, yes, he talks to us through the believers. I'm with you. I, this is fresh on my mind because I was recently, over the last week, had a lot of conversations about this with people in my church who are strongly on the other side and saying, no, God is speaking to me, giving me special messages that I need to follow. And like, I can't deny your experience unless what you're saying God is saying to you is against the Bible. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's a bad path to follow. That is ultimately going to lead you to a shallow, immature faith. And we want to be pressing on to maturity, which is looking to his word for his word, not to the thought, the machinations of our own mind. Uh, but I digress. <laughs> he speaks in the sound of his voice is so sweet, and the birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. God has a pretty voice. Yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Or it could be what he is saying is sweet to my ears, just like, just like David says in the Psalms. Yeah. Whoa. So good. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. You gotta leave. <laughs> yeah, I want to stay in the garden. I want to be around him, but I gotta leave. What do I have to go do? Share him with others. Yeah, he didn't actually say that, but yeah, that's. I mean, that's we know what. what Don't it stay in your Christian bubble. Yeah. But people pop it and walk out. Pop, pop, pop. 
Pop, 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 So yeah, as you can probably tell, my problem with this hymn is the uh, vagary of it. Uh, I prefer things that are substantially saying something. This one isn't saying much. But. Oh, well. It's still a well-known hymn. Worth being aware of. Let the thunder rain. Is that, why did that start? Wee! Yeah, that's Stephen's playing along. It was in 1912 that music publisher Dr. Adam Giebel, or Giebel, Gable, Gable. Well, I was asked C. Austin Miles to write a hymn text that would be sympathetic in tone, breathing tenderness in every line, one that would bring hope to the hopeless, rest for the weary, and downy pillows to dying beds. Wow. Miles himself left the following account of the writing of the resulting hymn. One day, in March 1912, I was seated in the dark room where I kept my photographic equipment and organ. I drew my Bible toward me. It opened at my favorite chapter, John 20, whether by chance or inspiration, let the reader decide. That meeting of Jesus and Mary had lost none of its power to charm. As I read it that day, I seemed to be part of the scene. I became a silent witness to that dramatic moment in Mary's life when she knelt before her Lord and cried, Rabboni! My hands were resting on the Bible while I stared at the light blue wall. As the light faded, I seemed to be standing at the entrance of a garden, looking down a gently widening path, shaded by olive branches. A woman in white, with head bowed, hand clasping her throat as if to choke back her sobs, walked slowly into the shadows. It was Mary. As she came to the tomb upon which she placed her hand, she bent over to look in and hurried away. John, in flowing robe, appeared, looking at the tomb. Then came Peter, who entered the tomb, followed slowly by John. As they departed, Mary reappeared, leaning her head upon her arm at the, womb, at the tomb. She wept. Turning herself, she saw Jesus standing, and so did I. I knew it was he. Excuse me, I knew it was he. She knelt before him with arms outstretched, and looking <coughs> into his face, face cried, Habone. I awakened in full light, Gripping the Bible with muscles, tense, and nerves vibrating under the inspiration of this vision, I wrote as quickly as the words could come could be formed. The poem exactly as it has since appeared. That same evening, I wrote the music. Next to the old rugged cross, this hymn has been one of the most popular gospel hymns used during the Billy Sunday revival campaign. Sunday was a baseball star turned evangelist, and his campaigns featured his energetic and powerful preaching, which centered around the Bible and moral living for the American church. Do you guys know Billy Sunday? No. Isn't he the one that, uh, oh, what's his face? We'll recap, hang on a minute. Um, Billy, Billy Graham was saved at one of his crusades or something. I had that thought also, and I think that might be correct. Uh, like, a, it's, uh, or, no, wait. It's a different Sunday that used to lead us in the music, right? Or no? I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm confused. But Sunday is somehow associated in my mind with Billy Graham. I don't know what, but how. Oh, sorry. Billy Sunday is probably the biggest American revival preacher. Uh, at least of the of the twentieth century, for sure. He had a bigger following than Billy Graham. Really, for sure. I didn't know that. I looked it up, and it says William Ashley Sunday. Yeah. Wait. Bill is short for William. Oh. <laughs> uh, so this is Billy Sunday preaching. It's like Bob is short for Bob. I love it. <laughs> Billy Civilization and society rests on morals. Morals rest on religion. Religion rests on the Bible and faith in God and in Jesus Christ. The Bible doesn't condemn any man because of his wealth. The Bible says the man that don't provide for his family is worse than an infidel. According to our standard of gold and silver, Abraham was worth a billion and a half of dollars. David was worth three billion. Solomon was worth five billion. Solomon could have hired Andrew Carnegie for a butler, J. Pierpont Morgan to cut his lawn, and Andrew Mellon for a chauffeur, and John D. Look to black his boots. America needs a tidal wave of the old-time religion. 
America needs to be taken down the God's bathhouse and the hose to turn on her. And the time isn't far distant when the wheels of God's judgment are going to go sweeping through this old God-hating world. And I want to take a pledge in this audience to join me in a pledge that you will never rest until this old God-hating, Christ-hating, whiskey-soaked, Sabbath-breaking, blaspheming, infidel, bootlegging old world is bound to the cross of Jesus Christ by the golden chains of love. He must be rolling in his grave today. Yeah. And you can tell the main issue back then had something to do with liquor. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. He was a big preacher in the aboli abolitionist movement. Uh, whiskey swelling or whatever he's... Like whiskey soap. Whiskey swelling. Whiskey soap, I think. Oh, yeah, right. whiskey soap. That's right. Same thing. So, so. He's an interesting figure to read on. I think he did understand the gospel, and I think that a lot of people did hear the gospel because of him. However, a lot of people also heard moralism because of him. Of be a good person, because that's what Christians are. And that's a problem for me. <laughs> the, the import of that preaching can be seen in today's church. There's a lot of people who view Christianity as being good, not about believing a set of historical facts and thus receiving eternal life. Um, so. worth, worth reading about, worth learning about Billy Sunday. Uh, you, want to, you want to know who's shaped the, the modern American church more than anybody else? It's him. Um, I just have a hard time believing that that was more popular than Billy for him. Yeah. <laughs> Today we're picking up in Revelation chapter 4. Hey, I read that. Hey, I did too. I took notes on it. Well, no, I don't. I'm waiting. I already said. So you need help finding the book of Revelation. No! You go to the book of Jude and turn one page forward. Ooh! What did you say? He did it different. But still annoying. A uh, throne in heaven. In Revelation chapter 4. What's happened so far in Revelation? Somebody give me the outline of Revelation. Three point outline. Comes from verse 19 of chapter 1. What? What is the things you have seen, seen, seen the things that that will take place are, seen, are, are and the things, things that will come. will come after these things. Yeah. So day one was the things that, that you have seen, which is Jesus appeared to Abel Patmos, right? That's chapter one. Yeah. The things which are the letters. The letters, chapters two to three. And chapter four and onward is things that will come. After these things. So we're, we're transitioning that into future stuff in the book of Revelation. Uh, <laughs> Where's Revelation on the timeline? Right at the end. Well, at the beginning. Yeah, over at the end. Yeah, right there. That's right what you there. said. Yeah, right there. Uh, that means that all of this... Right in between those two parallel lines. You gotta read that. It's not Yeehaw's on the That means all of this helps you understand this, yes? Yes. Hence the big problem with understanding the book of Revelation. Why it's so hard to read and why so many people misunderstand it so often is because they don't know this really, really, really well. So this comes along and they're like, I'm trying to read the last chapter of a book I haven't read. It's confusing. Uh, so. We're endeavoring to do something quite confusing in this course because everybody in here, myself included, don't know this really, really, really well. I would venture to guess I know it a little bit better than y'all. That's just the reality of the fact that I've spent a lot of time doing this. So I'm going to try and point to the parts that, that sh in here that show up over here as we go. And your kind of rule of thumb to go by, I'm going to try and say this every week, is... Everything in Revelation is an allusion to something that's already been said previously in the text somewhere. Basically, everything in Revelation is uh, is a further explanation of things that have already been revealed, with a few exceptions, but the vast majority of it 
Look back in the book and you'll find the answer to how to interpret it. What most people will do, and I myself am guilty of it, and I'll probably even still be guilty of it as I'm going through it this time with y'all, is that we'll try and look at, at uh, first century Greek culture, or we'll try and look at, for something outside the Bible to help us understand what Revelation is saying. And I'm trying to not do that as much as possible, because the Bible gives you everything you need to know to interpret the Bible. All of those prefaces said, pick it up in chapter 4, so right there, with the heavenly scene. We're starting into the after these things. So everything 4 through 10 is after these things, after future events. <coughs> and did we read it? Who didn't read it? I read it. If you didn't read it, raise your hand. I didn't read it recently. Okay. <laughs> I have read it in the past. Okay. I fully intend to read it. Oh, that's I... just as good as having read it. To hell is paid good intentions. Basically, the, we we get a picture of heaven, and we'll we'll read the beginning parts really slowly and carefully, and then I'll I'll kind of speed through and be summarizing for you what's happening. But um, we're gonna look at the image, the thing that he sees. There's a lot of, this is where the weird stuff starts, this chapter 4. Uh, we're going to try and look at all the pieces of the image. Similar to a... <coughs> let me back up. So, similar to a parable, every character who shows up in, in an image or a vision, in, like in Revelation, has some sort of referent. You guys know what a referent is? I think I've used that word in here before. Something that which is referenced to... Yeah, something that you're referring to. to. Yeah. Uh, so, all of the metaphors, pictures that you see are pictures of something real, some something <coughs> concrete. Maybe not physical. Could be like a real idea or a real truth, but it's got a concrete reference. It's not just a picture that means nothing. Uh, so, all of the components of this image, the pieces, as I'm calling them. The characters, the, the weird creatures that we're going to see, the elders that we're going to see, have to be representing something. They have to have a referent. And so the question is, we're interpreting Revelation, is what is that referent? So we're going to look at the image, we're going to try and get a real clear pi picture of what did John see, then we're going to look at the pieces and try and figure out what do these pieces mean, and at the end we'll try to tie it all together as, okay, what does this mean for the Christian today? Uh, what do you learn from this section of Revelation uh, that's important? So the image. Read along with me. Chapter 4, verse 1. Till what? Till whatever? Yeah, just read along with me. I'll stop. Wait, hold on. Uh, I can't find Revelation. So. Okay. I can't find Revelation. You're good That's what she said. Oh, I don't know. You're in Revelation. Leah, it. it's in the back of your Bible. I'm going to throw this one so at you. Even, how do you find Revelation? Go to the back cover and then turn back a few pages. Uh, Sometimes it may be a lot, because you may have maps. Like yeah. That. Chapter 4, verse 1. After this, after what? This. After the, the church. This, the letters this, of the yeah. after, after Jesus finished talking about, send all these, these letters to these churches, right? Because I've been talking this whole time. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. After these things, right? Third point. After the letter. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne, and he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Okay. Stop this. Uh, start with, with the image. Uh, I saw and a door was open in heaven. Now, does this mean that we saw a door open up in the sky? Possibly. Possibly. <laughs> sure. <laughs> is, there, is there really so much of a problem with taking this literally? No. Okay, it's probably a metaphor. It probably just means like some sort of passageway open. But, sure, I'll go with an actual literal door. They did have doors back then. What? What's the harm? I, uh, they were like I tend to always say default to the literal understanding, because you'll get in less trouble that way. Uh, so if you don't know what you're doing, just go with, I know what he saw. 
he said it was like this, and so I'm going to go with that's what it that's what it's like. Uh, so, that's a, so he sees a door open in heaven, and a voice the first voice that he heard speaking, whose voice is that? God. Spirit? We don't know that for sure, I guess. A trumpet. Or maybe it's Jesus, because Jesus is the one that it's gave a him trumpet. the letters. It's definitely a trumpet. <laughs> Voice like a trumpet, right? Which means what? It's a trumpet. It means it's loud. loud. There we go. A trumpet player. <laughs> uh, we actually do know exactly who this is. This is an angel. Oh, I'll, I'll show you how we get it. Uh, and yeah, some of your Bibles, if you have red letters, mm -hmm. the, the following words are, are in red. They're wrong. And I'll demonstrate that now. <laughs> the first voice which I heard, speaking to me like a trumpet, said, come up here. Okay, so then we go back and we say, what's the first voice that John heard in this story? In 110. Yeah, 110. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Zymus, etc. And I turned to see where the voice was coming from. I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw Jesus. And we assumed that that seems like Jesus is the one speaking. But no. Uh, there was a voice, sounds like a trumpet, speaking to him. Write what you see. Okay. Whose voice is that? Go back up to chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things which must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. This is what he reads the words of his prophecy. But he received this vision by the mediation of an angel on the direction of God. With me? That's what he says in chapter 1, verse 1. So why is Jesus there? If an angel is the one speaking, yeah, <laughs> Jesus is Jesus. to get John's so, attention. So, so you're saying that, like, when you said that those who have red letter Bibles and that it's in red letters is wrong. Yeah. So all of this is not supposed to be in red, or were you just talking about just chapter, chapter four, four, verse two, or okay. verse one? Okay, okay, okay. The voice who says, "Come up here, and I'll I will show you," is the voice of an angel. An angel. And that. Because it's the one he heard first. It's the one he's heard first. Okay. It's the one who said, write what you see in a book. And John mm -hmm. says, I received this by the mediation of an angel. Mm -hmm. And we keep going and we find out later that this voice shows up again. This, this guy shows up. Hey, he's an angel. So The people who are translating your Bibles and put those words in red, the, the come up here and I'll show you what must take place after this thing. If they put them in red, they're wrong. Categorically, 100%, I know I'm right on this. Okay. <laughs> Small point. Not really, not really that important. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's one of the few things I can be really, really, really sure about in Revelation. So I hit it hard. <laughs> uh, what does he see? Takes him up to heaven. Or he's in the spirit. And he sees heaven. Heaven being uh, the dwelling place of God, right? Question? I have a question about in the spirit. Yeah. Does that mean that he was... Possibly, well, again, we don't really know, I guess, but supernaturally Ghost. taken, no, that's not what I'm talking about, taken in the, in the spirit as if, like, he were dead? And I, yeah, I, or, I don't I know mean, exactly what he means by the phrase no, in the spirit. He started it off with, I was in the spirit on the Lord's Day on the Island right, of Atmos. Right, in the seventh heaven or something like that. Uh, I think it has some sort of <coughs> having a vision. Uh, the way that Daniel had visions, and the way that Ezekiel had visions, and the way that all the people had visions so before. John's say, using the phrase in the spirit to, to describe this. Okay, process. I was just going to ask if the ones in the Old Testament speak of in the spirit. Yeah, no, they don't use that phrase, no. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is fairly unique to John. Uh, so, what does he see? Read along with me. Chapter 4, verse 2. And once I was in the Spirit, behold, the throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, 
And seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, and rumblings, and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal, and around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the seventh, second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Hey, we know that phrase. All right, what's the picture? What all? What all are our components? What do we got? What's we in the very middle? Throne. Throne. Yeah. We got a throne, <coughs> and there's an alien and a and there's one seated on it, right? Yeah. He looks like carnelian and jasper. All right, what's the what's the like carnelian and jasper mean? Sparks. Like they're stones. They're not sparkly. Yeah. What color are a, these stones? A green no, or red. Like one is a red. Actually, both are red. Yeah, both are red. Yeah, Carnelian and Jasper are both red stones. I knew Carnelian was. No. What is Sardius? I guess that's just another Carnelian. Carnelian. Yeah. Emerald is green. I think. Emerald is green. Yeah, Emerald is green. So the guy seated on the throne is red. Got yes. it. Crazy, but got it. And around the throne, a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. So what color is the rainbow? Green, green. Green. Okay. A green rainbow. Yeah, I know it's a hard thing to picture. Uh, so and this is that's so one that I, I checked out. So basically. rainbow is not the best translation there. Halo would be a better. Oh, so well, then why is it rainbow? Green halo. Because it's light. Because it's translated in English. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so we know what who's on the throne. Red guy sitting on the throne with green halo around him. Uh, what else is around the throne? More thrones. More thrones. How many? 24. 24. 24. 24. Who's sitting on them? Elders. 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 Old people. Uh, <laughs> no, not old people. Presbyteros is the word. So people who hold the, the office of elder in, in the church, uh, possibly, maybe. We'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, but elders, 24 men who could be called elders. Generally speaking, elders are older people. That's why they are called Elders. Elders, yeah, because they're a little bit elder than us. Uh, but it has to do with the, with the white hair, the crown of wisdom. Uh, for, leader, for leadership. I mean, I'm just saying that elders, that's, I think oh, that's oh, where okay. that gotcha. idea comes from, is that, you know, where the crown, your gray hair is the crown of, gray hair. Crown of wisdom. And that's just the, the white that's just elder is say, the color white. Feel right. Right. Okay. Older. okay, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> Twenty-four elders. What are they wearing? Uh, white, gold, gold, uh, white garments and gold crowns. crowns. White on garments, gold crowns on their heads. To be specific, the crowns were on their head. What's coming from the throne? Flashes of lightning and peals of thunder. Flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. They're not rolls; it's peals. <laughs> and before the throne were what? Seven lamps. Seven lamps, which are what? The seven spirits. Of God. The seven spirits of God. Okay, we know what the seven lamps are. They're the seven spirits of God. What does that mean? We'll get to that. <laughs> well, and mine has a, has a footnote of sevenfold spirit. The sevenfold spirit. That's even yeah. more seven confusing. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. Yeah, you we want to make sure we understand promise? the image. Exactly. Promise. Yes. Okay. Uh, and what, what's, what's out stretched out before the throne? Beasts. Sea of glass. A sea oh, yeah. like, like crystal, crystal or like glass. Uh, a big expanse of space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clear. All right, four beasts. Yeah, is that what your translation is? Beasts. Living yes. Which, which four, living four, living four living creatures. Yeah, mine says four, says four living creatures. Full of eyes and full of them back. No, that's not just that. The first four living creatures. Four living creatures. Four living creatures. Okay. Living creatures is the best translation, so I'm glad they they rendered that. That's literally what they are, and that's very important that that's what they are. Because the beast is, to me, is evil. Chapter 13, yeah. Okay, four living creatures. Uh, what what do they look like? A lion, a lion with an outstretched eagle, yeah, a man. A lion, a lion an eagle, eagle, a man, and a an ox. And an ox. No. And, yes. and a, and a no. calf. Because a 
Because creature was like a lion. Okay. It resembled. Yeah, it, it resembled. It, it all resembled. Good. Yeah, it's a simile. Okay. Uh, Whatever, Leo. Uh, full of eyes. It's not English. Full of eyes in front and back. Okay. And they had wings. Not very nice. And they had wings. How many wings? Six. Six. Six, six each. <laughs> it's not like the four of them were fighting over six wings. And they're like, hey, you get two, you get two, you get one, and you get one. No. They Boy. Use it. They're all equal. I thought that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> the delivery not was a little Not those off. wings. Uh, oh. <laughs> what? I just found that so <laughs> That's fantastic. He's talking about like buffalo wild wings. Full of eyes. Oh. Oh. <laughs> the day and night. They never cease to say what? What are they doing? What are these holy, four living holy, creatures doing? Praising holy, the Lord. Praising the Lord. They're saying, Holy, holy, and holy is the Lord God Almighty. Who was and is and is to come. Who was and is and is to come. Uh, who was and is and is to come. Or is this reference to past, present, present future, future. future. Past, he present, future. is. How would you say? I am. Yeah, there we go. I am that I am. I am that I am, right? God's name, Yahweh, means I am. That. They're, they're referencing the self-existence of God. Anybody remember back from when we did theology with the self-existence, the fancy theological word? <laughs> no, but I'm sure if you... Give I thought I heard somebody say it. Maybe I was well, just hearing things. Tell us that tell you. The aseity of God? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's what it's not. Yeah. The what? <laughs> the aseity of God? The self-existence of God? Oh, uh, he is. The aseity. All right, we got the picture, yeah? Wait, so a little bit of a tangent. Uh, by saying God is, is it everlasting or eternal? Uh, both. Okay. Wait, give me your definitions so I can... <laughs> eternal is more like outside of time. Everlasting is within time. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would still say both. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Alright, we got the picture. We know what's going on, yeah? We, we know what the pieces are so far. Verse 9. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, so the four beasts, whenever they're singing this song, which is when? All the time. All the time. All the time. And through that whole time, the elders. The 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you are you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Yeehaw. Where is it? Alright. That's chapter four. What? Uh, I'm going to so I'm gonna decide to skip ahead to this. We're just... I'm going to show you three different artist renderings of this. I want, want you to tell me what they get right and what they get wrong. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, she threw it throne. at me. They all Thank have you. wings. Thank okay, they all have wings. Six what of them, yeah. Six wings, We've got the lion, but the man, the ox, the eagle. Uh, are there actually 24 elders? Yes, there are. Just coming. There's 24 <laughs> elders. Uh, all... Is this guy the right color? Yes. yes. Yeah. Is the is the bow, the halo, the right color? Oh, yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah, okay, what about this? Seven lamp. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Seven. Pretty good job, right? Wow. The beasties aren't on all sides of the throne, though. Right, okay, so the beasts aren't all around, the, the elders aren't all around, right, because they got to open it up for the camera. They're not full of eyes. They're not full of eyes, there oh, we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The yeah, they are. They could just yes, be. But the are. wings, they aren't on the wings, and it says in they the description. Weren't they under the wings, wings, though? Or that's just yes, it says an artist rendering, and it just looks sort of like pine cones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, those could be eyes, though, but... <laughs> <laughs> what about um, what, are you doing? what about what's coming from the throne? Lightning. Lightning. Flash of lightning, right? You can't hear that. the thunder, man. No, you can, you can see it. Thunder, you can see it. Uh, uh, -uh. What's so? There, I, there's still one thing see, that's wrong boom, with this picture that you guys haven't boom. zoomed in on yet. Uh, what are these guys doing? They're not bowing down. No, it's the it's the elders that are going to be bowing down. Yeah, there you go. The elders aren't bowing down. These guys are constantly singing. Yeah. The eagle doesn't look holy, like holy, it's holy. in flight either. And whenever they're... 
But his wings are raised, is it right? right? But so are the lions. Okay, but it just says it's the lions resembled. of flight two. It didn't say that. Okay. It just says, it just, the, the important thing: the, the elders aren't bowing down, right? And the elders should be throwing their crowns before. Okay. But they're doing that, but because well, because at one point it does say they're seated in the thrones around. Right. It's later that it says that they're. That they're bowing mm -hmm. down. Maybe so, it's only made a short film. Of, they haven't bowed of down yet. It'd be more accurate. Uh, there you go. This is a great high quality artist rendering. But, uh, I like did you like it? it? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Eagle what? still doesn't look like it's in flight. <laughs> Eagle still doesn't look like it's in flight. Where are the eyes? We got the seven, we got the seven oh, torches. We got the lightning. <laughs> <laughs> we got a twenty four elders. That's an actual <laughs> rainbow. It's not like emerald. Not there you go. Green. Okay, so green. the and rainbow is actually rainbow, not emerald. So what's, what's the, the glass? The is Where's the sea green. of glass? Yeah. Where's the sea of glass? It's so green. green it is, or or pur purple. 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 Or perhaps the green circle it's is what very the, obscure. The rainbow is. Yeah. yeah. So they have a, little, a few things off. What is the thing wait, besides the, yeah, what is, it looks like that? A, this is chapter five, so that's we haven't gotten the, there yet. Oh my it's God, a palm tree with a face and legs. Yeah. No, that's the. He's that's not the, fully red. It kind of looked like the elders had wings too. It did, but I think those were robes. I like okay. this one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. That one's nice. All right, the elders are all what bowing oh. as they should be. You got the green halo. You've got the the There's one big light. problem is no he's red. not red. And There's no lightning. And there's well, I mean. It's not lightning. And is that, okay, is that <laughs> seven lamps or is that one lamp with seven fires? Yeah, okay, so this is this takes the seven torches as, as a reference to the menorah, the, menorah uh, the seven lamps that exist in the temple. I actually doing? like that. Uh, that's probably more accurate yeah. to what uh, was supposed to be. Um, they just need to work on their eyes. Yeah, what, I don't remember the symbolism of the menorah. Like, why does it look like <laughs> It's the seven, seven flames or whatever. Well, if this short, <laughs> uh, the the undisputed one is the seven, the seven branches of the menorah represent the seven days of creation. Okay. And so when they light light the the, the lamps each day, the mm -hmm. seventh day represents the day on which God rested. Okay. There's a lot of other things that you could say. All of it. Open to discussion, so. Okay. We'll just I thought it had some. Okay, yeah, never mind. Some would also say the seven continents. Yeah. Oh, okay. See, I thought it might have had something to do with the. It was in the Maccabees or something where they were without. When the oil, oil, ran, oil ran out. Oil ran out. Yeah. yeah. I thought it had something to do with that. But, uh, like they were without light for seven days because they had run out or something. Right. They didn't have. Artists. They didn't have the oil to light the seven lamps of the menorah. Oh, that's But that's okay. not. Okay. The Maccabee thing wasn't why it has seven lamps. Okay, got it. Okay. Thank you. Alright, chapter five. So we're, we're cool on all this. We'll come back to this we're slide really? and go to our references in just a second. I want to make sure we get the picture down really clearly, though, and then we'll go back. It's crazy. Interpretation. Uh, mm -hmm. Chapter five. I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll, written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? No and one. no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. There it is again. Really, that, in that picture, that's a really big lamb. <laughs> it was really terrifying. <laughs> Sent oh, out God. into all the earth. Verse 7. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain 
and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made the kingdom, made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And I looked and I heard, and around the throne the living creatures and the elders, and the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. All right, so what new piece is introduced to the picture? Uh, oh, wow. A scroll. Oh, A scroll first, yeah. See, this scroll in, where is the scroll? Some right, that mm. the right hand, yeah. The right hand of the one who's sitting on the throne. Yeah. The right hand of the red guy. Uh, and what's it got on it? Seven, seven seals. seals. It's sealed with seven seals. So you guys know what this picture looks like, right? What a scroll with seven seals looks like, like that. Yeah. Here, you're seeing the seals on the scroll with me. Those seals are poorly positioned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you would think that God would be more exact here. Yeah. But that's an actual image of the scroll in heaven, so... Uh. Okay, we do. And Stevens and Aaron, so... Wow, well, I thought we had that one. Of course not. What else shows up? So, he sees the scroll, nobody's worthy to open the scroll, so what does John do? He cries. And who taps him on the shoulder and says, hey, cut it out? An elder. An elder. An elder. He says, hey, look, who's coming? <coughs> No. What is he, who does he say is coming? You don't the lion. Oh, right. the lion. lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David. The root of David was conquered, and he's going to open the seven scrolls. Yeah. But you just got to be really specific. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And then we see what? It, the, the next to the saw the amongst them standing next to the, the lion, next to the throne the lamb. You got seven eyes and seven horns. Yeah. And he's There's standing as. Standing as though he had been slain. Oh. Seven eyes, seven horns, and he went and took the scroll. And when he taken the scroll, everything, all heaven breaks loose, right? They're like, yes! Wait. Somebody who's worthy to take the scroll. Yeah. So, Ron is saying he's standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. So it yeah. sounds like he's taking the place of the red man. Not quite. Uh, so, it's center of the throne. The, really, the most literal you go is he's in the midst of. Okay, so he's just in the middle with the red man. Yeah. They just not, they're not saying red man. Right yeah. Now. He's standing amidst the throne. Uh, same, same with the four living creatures. By the way, they they are amidst the throne. Uh, it could be a large throne. Yeah. It could be a really so around large seat in the midst of all okay. sitting on. Okay. Or like okay. Takes a scroll and everybody starts worshiping. You with me? We got your picture. Yeah. Or, this is, is a appropriate. Say yee haw, Leah. Yee haw. There you go. All right. Heaven. Which one do we see? Ah! <laughs> they all sit on it. Definitely Which one did he see? The first one. <laughs> Look at it, little chair it is. <laughs> That's what does it mean? That's a stunning right? hand. Because he had to somehow he's, fit seven eyes on a lamb. Hey, wait a second. Okay. That doesn't look like a lamb. Right? That is a lamb. And it doesn't have any puncture wounds in it. <laughs> okay. It doesn't look slain. But technically, wouldn't its throat be slit, though? Right? Depends on how you All right. kill a lamb. And he does have a nose. We're clear on the picture, no, yes? Yeah. It's nose or it's All right, eyes. let's start it's talking about the pieces. Fine, but yeah. No, hold on. Oh my gosh. Okay. Go back. <laughs> what? Because you have the seven horns. It's the same thing, just different interpretations. Wait, how many? Eyes are shut. Seven. seven. Look at the nose. One, two, three, four, five, oh. six, and ones that's hidden that you assume is on the other side where a normal eye would be. Terrifying. Yeah, because it doesn't look like he's slain. <laughs> of course, he actually has right. eight, Here's his brown eye. eye. Let's look at the pieces, okay? Start with uh, the throne of the four living creatures. What are, what are they? 
throne. The throne. Who's the one sitting on the throne? <coughs> Uh, what's, God, what's your best man. guess? Probably God. Red man. We're going to say God. What, why do we say God? Well, because it's like that. the lamb shows up, that means that the... He's going to answer the, the question. That was a rhetorical question. <laughs> Flip over to Daniel 7. So he didn't sound like Daniel 7? Yeah. Hey, I was reading Daniel like two weeks ago. But then I just kind of stopped reading my Bible a little. Daniel chapter 7. This is uh, a vision that Daniel receives about... The, the nations that are going to follow Babylon. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The vision of the four beasts, if you guys know that one. Right? Yeah. So it sees the, the lion, and then the bear, and then the leopard, and then the beast like none other. Uh, start in, there's this little kind of like parentheses in the middle of the vision. It starts in verse 9. As I looked, thrones were placed. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. Thousands and thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand, or you might say myriads on myriads, stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were open. You see the similar picture, yes? Alright, throne, the one sitting on it, the Ancient of Days. Uh, let's get down to verse 13. And I saw the, in the night visions, and behold, the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. He came to the Ancient of Days and was present, bef presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. We're seeing the same picture, right? Described differently, but we got a throne, ancient of days comes on the clouds, stands before him, and to him is given dominion, glory, and honor, and power. Which is pretty close to what these angels say when he takes the scroll. So the one who's sitting on the throne, ancient of days, God. Uh, appearance like Jasper and Carnelian, why is he described as red? I think... Fire. Burning anger. Possibly that. I, I think it's more of a reference to those stones in particular, where you see those stones show up. You see them show up in the garden. You see them show up on the ephod. And it's the last stone. Yeah. Does that make sense for you? Question mark? Okay. The ephod is the last stone on on the, yeah. the the Jasper is the last stone on the ephod. Second time. The ephod is what the priest wears. Oh, this is the end. He's, he's letting you, he's cluing you in, this is the end. <coughs> Twenty-four elders are sitting on, sitting on the throne, we'll come back to them. Uh, let's look at these, oh, oh. The seven, uh, seven lands, which are the seven spirits of God. What does that mean? Here's my best guess. Isaiah 11. We'll go to Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11. What's Isaiah 11 about? Anybody remember? What? You guys know Isaiah, real, like the back of your hand, right? Definitely. So when I say chapter 11, you go... Like the back of somebody else's hand. <laughs> <laughs> Straight, like the back of my hand. Whoa, that's new. <laughs> <laughs> 11, 1, 2, 3? Yeah. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Sound familiar from what we recently just read? Yeah. Yeah? The root of David? Mm -hmm. Jesse is David's father. Right, so we're talking about the same guy. A branch from his root shall bear fruit. Verse two, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and mind, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. How many spirits is that? Seven. There you go. Seven sevenfold spirit of the Lord shall rest upon the Lamb, which is why when the Lamb has seven eyes, which are the Seven spirits of the Lord, the root of David, who's shown up, the Lamb. I think that that's a reference to Isaiah 11. I think that's that's what we're talking about. So we're talking about the the image of God, the attributes that contribute to His one Spirit. I see uh, six. Uh, the Lord. Well, yeah, but it looks the way this is written. It looks like the Spirit 
of the Lord will rest on him. Dash, and then and then these other six spirits are describing what the spirit of the Lord is. It looks like the spirit of the Lord is like the umbrella. Right. And then this, 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 and this, but there's only six. Yeah, it's it's, it's more of so so the way I, the image I would give you to do is the six days of creation, mm-hmm. and the seventh he rested. The seventh one's different. The seventh one is the spirit of the Lord, the culmination, the finality of it. The spirit of the Lord. So that's one. And then your other six add. Kind of like a... So it's it's the it's the bigger, better, final summing up kind of thing is the spirit of the Lord. But it's still one of the seven for... But that's my best guess as to what, what we're talking about. The sevenfold spirit of the Lord. They all have the same tone. <laughs> yeah. It's under heavenly scene. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Living creatures. All right. What are these guys doing here? All right. This one I uh, am more confident on. These are four angels whose job it is to guard and worship God. How do I know this? Go to Ezekiel chapter 1. I'm going to read fast. Read along with me. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1. This is how Ezekiel starts off his book. He's letting the reader know up front, hey, you're going to see some weird stuff if you keep reading. In the 30th year of the 4th month of the 5th day of the month, as I was among the exiles of Kebar Penal, the heavens were opened and I saw visions from God. On the 5th day of the month, it was the 5th year of the exile of King Jehoiakim, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the Kebar Canal, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. As I looked, verse 4, as I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, a great cloud with brightness around it, fire flashing forth from it continually in the midst of the fire, as it were gleaming metal. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had a human likeness, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under the wings of the four of their four sides they had human hands, and the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each one had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side. The four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. And their wings were spread about above. Each creature had two wings. Each of them touched the wings of another with two covered their bodies. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit would go, they went without turning as they went. So they're like this shield that encircles the spirit in his vision and what's the spirit keep reading uh verse 13 or no it's v- verse 14 the living creatures darted to and fro like the appearance of flashing of lightning now as i looked at the living creatures i saw a wheel on the <coughs> earth beside the living creatures one for each other. Nah, i keep going Let's jump down the wheels are weird yeah we don't have time for that right now where does the throne start coming out There it is, verse 26. And above the expanse over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne and the appearance of a sapphire. What color is a sapphire? And seated above the likeness of the throne was the likeness with a human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist I saw, as it were, gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. Gleaming metal, like what color is metal when it gleams? Red. Red, like the one sitting on the throne is red. Like the appearance of fire enclosed all around and downward from what the appearance of his waist I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire and of brightness all around him. Like the appearance of a bow in the clouds and the ra- day of rain. So was the appearance of the brightness all around him. Why did they translate it rainbow? Because of Ezekiel chapter 1. Uh, so He's seeing the exact same thing Ezekiel saw. This is the throne room of heaven. God is there. These four angels encircle him as a sort of protection and worship. My, my Bible says lapis, lapis azul. La, yeah, lapis, lapis, same color. Lapis, 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 lap
which is where we get our word sapphire. Which makes more sense. Yeah. Hey, that's why I know that. That's exactly why. Alright, focus. Or if you went to Crest. Refocus. Focus, I guess. You with me? I'm, I'm losing you. I'm losing you. Okay. Ezekiel 1, you, you, you heard that description, right? It sounds exactly like the throne room that, that John saw, with a few exceptions. The four creatures each have four faces instead of one. And uh, but there's still four of them, and what four animals? The same four, yeah. right? Four still wings four wings instead of six, wings. which... Uh, the, the guy sitting on the throne, same color, uh, we're, we're seeing the same thing. He's hearkening back to this image that Ezekiel saw. And this is how, this is, this is John uh, letting you know, hey, I'm right in line with the story. This shouldn't surprise you, reader, that you're seeing these weird things. You've seen this before. You've read Ezekiel. Uh, this is God giving his message, and he's giving you a little bit more information. He's further explaining what happens in this throne room scene. Uh, the lamb comes, uh, kicks off the end times. Uh, I'll let you read Ezekiel, uh, the, the rest of Ezekiel after, <coughs> later. But So that's what these four... Angels are, and they are... How do I know they're angels? Is he, uh, Isaiah 6. The, the six wings of the, of the angels in Revelation as opposed to the four wings in Ezekiel. Why the difference? I think it's because John is pulling two different images to let you know, uh, one, his authority. He's, he's drawing from the story. You've seen this before. Ezekiel, or Isaiah 6 describes the, another scene of the throne room of God. We don't see these four living creatures, but we do see two angels who have six weeks in that vision. So he's pulling images of throne room scenes that you've seen throughout the story to let you know he's right on track with, with the biblical authors. He's, he's stringing these images together. And you, you might even say, God is showing him these images strung together uh, to give his message the authority that it deserves, to let you know. Exactly. So it's not like he's just it's like all this stuff that you've been that, that have just been popping up throughout the story is finally coming to a head. It's that character who shows up. It's like like when uh, like look at Chronicles of Narnia, right? We hear about Aslan over and over and over again. It's like when is he going to show up? And boom, he does, and stuff starts happening. It's it's that kind of a, a thing. We've seen this a throne room, and we've gotten glimpses of angels, and we've gotten these four living creatures, and we've gotten the, uh, the Ancient of Days, and, and they've just been like, we think that something's going to happen, and they never do throughout the story, and then finally we're here at Revelation, and it's going down. Uh, we're tying it all together. All those loose ends, all those images you saw before, we're going to finish them up and, and bring them to fruition here in Revelation. Again, I repeat. Almost everything in Revelation is a reference or an allusion back to something earlier in the story. Uh, why a lion, a calf, a, um, a man, and an eagle? I think these these four things represent these four animals. Let me get over to my the pieces part. That's the elders. That's the lamb. That's the four living creatures. Why these four animals? Uh, I, I think that they're representing the superlatives of God. The lion, the fiercest, the ox, the strongest, the eagle, the highest, the man, the most glorious. Uh, these are representing the greatness or the fullness or the, the estness of God. Right? You with me on that? How about these 24 elders? 24 elders, okay, clearly uh, that's something we heard, we've heard in church reference and Israel reference. 24 men. Uh, there's three major views. I'm kind of unconvinced. I'll actually tell you, I, I, I think that I take a fourth. But I'll give you the three major ones and, uh, and then tell you what I think. Uh, first of all, representative of the church. What's the evidence for this? Well, they're clothed in white. We've already seen in Revelation where the churchmen were promised they would be clothed in white, walking with Jesus in the re resurrection. So uh, there's a strong, strong suggestion that these 24 elders are representative of the church in some way, at least. 
Uh, furthermore, they're holding uh, censures and harps, bulls, and they bow before God. And it says in the text, these bulls are the prayers of the saints. So it would make sense that these are then representative of the saints, the church. Another possibility, representative of Israel. Uh, there's 24 officers in the priesthood of, of, of Aaron. You go read uh, 1 Chronicles 24, you actually get the, these, uh, there's this, when they're setting up the priesthood, Aaron and his sons, uh, he's got four sons, two of them die, right? Adab and, and Abihu, they, they offer up the false fire, right? You guys remember this story? Kind of. Nadab and Abihu, they, they get all cocky and they try to tell God, hey, we're going to worship you this way, and God's like, boom! And they burned it down. And so Aaron's only got two sons left. He's like, all right, you guys are the new priests. <laughs> uh, they only have, they have 24 sons between them, 24 descendants who they're making different offices within the priesthood. Uh, and he goes through and he lists them. They, they draw lots to decide who will do what role in, in the temple, what office they will hold in the priesthood. And there's 24 of them. I think that's a strong indication of, uh, we're talking about elders, representatives of, before God of, of, of a people group. Makes sense that these 24 elders might be representative of Israel. Uh, representative angels, the only real evidence for this is that they're in heaven, and only angels are in heaven. So that's a thought, too. I tell you, I, I take a, a strange kind of mix of the two. I, I, I think that they are representative of the church that is true Israel. We've, we've been talking about this a lot um, over the last six, seven months. It keeps cropping up. But the, the fact that uh, Gentiles are grafted into Israel and Paul's revelation of the mystery in, in Romans 11, right? A partial hardening has come over the hearts of Israel till the fullness of the Gentiles may be grafted in and then all Israel will be saved. Uh, I think true Israel is, is the same thing as what we would call the church. Uh, those Israel that will be saved, the, the people of faith. And the people of faith has been rep represented by two major groups throughout history, elders, or excuse me, the, the, the church and Israel. Um, this is where I start to break with some of my dispensationalist friends on wanting a really strong distinction between church and Israel. I see a slightly less strong distinction. Uh, but why 24? Well, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 Apostles of the church. Uh, we're bringing them together. 12 plus 12 is 24. So I, I think this, these 24 elders might be a representative of true Israel, the church. Uh, all of the people of faith from the beginning of history to the end are represented in, in these 24 elders, I think. Yeah, question. Okay. Um, so the apostles, the 12 apostles, were they all Jews? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this the church Israel distinction is one that I I I don't I don't get what dispensationalists mean when they, when they talk about the, the church Israel distinction because the church contains a lot of Israelites and so are we talking about Israel the future Israel will be those Israelites who aren't part of the church and they always say no okay so then the church has replaced Israel. And they're like, no, we don't like church replacement, re replacing Israel theology. I'm like, yeah, I don't like the church replacing Israel theology either. I'm saying the church has always been true Israel. True Israel has always been the church. The people of faith. People who are saved by grace through faith. In the Old Testament, before the coming of the Messiah, you re express that faith by converting to the nation of Israel, becoming an Israelite, and post the coming of the, of the Messiah, you express that faith by a proclamation of faith, by the circumcision of the heart instead of the circumcision of the flesh. Uh, so there is a difference, right? We, we worship in different ways now than they did, uh, than the church did when it was Israel. But it's the same people group, I think. I'm getting off track and I'm starting to ramble on, uh, and if any of my dispensationalist friends watch this video, then they're going to be uh, talking my ear off, so I'll stop, stop there. Uh, Short version, I think the elder is representative of all the people of faith. True Israel, descendants of Abraham, call it whatever you like. People who will be saved, that's the 24 elders who they represent. 
How about the lamb? This one should be pretty easy. Who's the lamb? Jesus. Jesus. How do we know? Because he is the lamb. He's the lamb. Because he's the lion of the tribe. And he's worthy. Lamb. All right, where does all this stuff come from? How do, how do we know? From, not from, well, we've always been taught that Jesus is the lamb. Where does the Bible say that Jesus is the lamb, that Jesus is the root of David, that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah? In, in, uh, in, in chapter 5. Good. We're, well, the root hang on. Of David. Right, okay, so we know that, that whoever the lamb is that shows up is also the root of David and the lion of the tribe of Judah. Yeah. How do we know that, that, that this is Jesus, the guy who was killed in the gospel that you wrote earlier, John? You're really close. It's, it's in there too. What do they say when he takes the scroll? They praise him. Yeah, how do they praise him? Do they lay down their crown? They've already been laying down their crown. Uh, well, I was going to go with, with verse 9. To receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And you were slain by your blood. You ransomed people for God for every, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. That's what Jesus did, right? That's, that's our connection. Uh, what, is, what is meant by Lion of the tribe of Judah? Okay, first of all, Jesus, how do we, the Lamb who is slain. The book of John, which John also wrote Revelation gives us this connection. What does is, what is John the Baptist say in the book of John of Jesus when he first sees him? He says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. world. Alright, there's our connection in the biblical story. Jesus is the Lamb. Alright, so when the Lamb shows up, who's taking away the sins of the world. Boom, Jesus of Nazareth. We got it. That's, that's where the Bible connects those things. Okay. Uh, what about the Lion of the tribe of Judah and the, the root of D David. Now you already already demonstrated, right? In Revelation it says, Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, and then the Lamb shows up. So since the Lamb is Jesus, based on John 129, that means the Lamb, Jesus, is also the root of David and the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Where do those phrases come from? What do they mean? Good question. <laughs> uh, Genesis 49.9 is where we see the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Get, get back to you. What's going on in Genesis 49? give you a hint. There's only 50 chapters in Genesis. So how does the book of Genesis end? Yeah. 49 and 50 is some of the best parts. Death. <laughs> death. <laughs> it does end with death. 48-49 uh, is, is Jacob blessing his 12 sons, the 12 tribes. It's setting up to let you know how are these 12 tribes going to play out for the next 38 books. That this the next thirty eight books of this of this book is going to be about them. So oh, it's Jacob blessing his sons, right? So he goes through them one at one at a time. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, etc. He gets to Judah and he says, "Judah, you are a lion." So go to Genesis forty nine, verse nine. I already did. Read it for me. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares arouse him? Uh, keep going. Verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Yeah, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the Lord's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of all the All right, this is where the, the promise made of a seed that's been being passed down from generation, from Eve to Seth to Noah to, to uh, what can, uh, Shem, thank you. <laughs> Shem to Terah, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, the promise of the seed who is going to come from your loins, been passed down. And we've gotten to Jacob, and the question is, who does this promise continue on for? Who's, where are we looking for the seed? 
And if you read this, you realize Reuben's disqualified himself. He's not been the husband of one wife. He's gone in and, and uh, defiled himself with his father's wife. Uh, Simeon and Levi have defiled themselves, weapons of vengeance and violence. They, they went and, and slaughtered that whole city, right, when they got mad about the rape of Dinah. Uh, Judah almost disqualified himself, with, but then Tamar saved him. <laughs> Tamar came and, and did her whole thing to trick him into continuing the line of the sea. Uh, and um, you want to know more about that later, but if you read the read the uh, the blessings on, on his sons or the the promises to his sons, Reuben, you're my firstborn, my might, the first fruits of my strength, are preeminent in dignity, preeminent in power, unstable as water. You shall not have preeminence because you went up forth <coughs> to your father's bed and you defiled it. You slept with my wife. Huh. What's well, this? Do you know? One of his wives. <laughs> Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul come not into their counsel. O oh my glory, be not joined to their company. They're not getting this promise passed on to them. Who does? Judah. Judah, you're alive. Your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion, and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah. You're going to be the ruling class. You're going to be the one from whom the king comes, who's going to crush the head of the serpent. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the guy who gets the promise, Jesus. With me? Yep. So, uh, root of David. I'll let you look up those, those passages for yourself. In Revelation chapter 22, he specifically says, Jesus shows up and says, I am the root of David. So it's like, all right, cool. Don't nice. need to work too hard for that one. But those are the other places where the root of David first gets introduced and shows up. So What's, it, it just says 2216. That's Revelation. Revelation. Uh, okay. uh, horns and eyes, uh, authority, and oversight, rule. So these are the, the seven spirits of God that are going forth into the world. Jesus is by his establish by his taking of the scroll, taking up his throne here at the end times, about to establish his kingdom. The seven spirits of God are going to go through him into the world and rule and reign. Horns are always representative of authority, rulers, kings. You get that from Daniel and Ezekiel and Zechariah. So that's one of those those ones that we looked last time we met. We talked about the the different ways you interpret a vision. One that's common to scripture, horns are always representative of kings. Whenever you see a beast show up with X number of horns, something to do with his rulership, his reign, his kingdom, his power, or a specific man who is acting as a king. The scroll we're going to get into next time, and when he starts opening it. So suffice it to say, a scroll is what you write down a judgment on. Right, you know, the judge writes down his judgment on the scroll. He hands it off to the bailiff. The bailiff breaks the seal and reads the judgment. And so, Jesus has grabbed the scroll and he's going to start breaking the seals. And when he starts breaking the seals, the judgment starts coming. And we're going to get into that next week. The interpretation, real short, real sweet. What's the what's the point? What's the big emphasis that you see in this section? Why do we, we see this scene? One, it's letting you know the end is coming and it's the, the pumps are primed. We're about to unleash hell on earth. In the midst of this, this is this is the backdrop. Things are about to get real bad on earth. What are they doing? Four different times, you see everybody in heaven stops and starts singing praises, worshiping the true triune God. The triune God is present, sevenfold spirit of God who is in the torches, the Father sitting on the throne, and the Lamb and the Son. You see the Trinity together here in one place, and everybody's worshiping like mad against the backdrop of judgment. Do we have time? Yeah, we're not too far over time. So we'll finish up with this. For what reason? does God receive worship in these chapters? So look at those, those verses I pulled up for you.
Verse 8, why are they worshiping him? Yeah. Well, what do they say? What do they say while worshiping him? Wasn't his news to go. They're worshiping him because he is. Uh, his sheer existence demands the worship. Uh, verse 11. What are they? How do they worship him? Or why do they worship him? You created all things. For you created all things by your will. They exist and they create. So his aseity, his creation. Uh, verse nine. They start worshiping the second person of the Trinity, the Son. Why do they worship him? Worthy. Worthy to take the scroll. What else? Why is he worthy to take the scroll? He was slain. His blood ransomed people of God from every tribe, tribe, language, and nation. He created the church. <laughs> he made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. Foreshadowing. Right? This is future stuff. And what is this? What is these people going to do? They're going to reign on earth. Okay, remember that when we get there. Uh, the people, the church, are going to reign on earth. Okay. Uh, and last bit, verse 12. <coughs> Again, worthy, yeah, because, worthy because he was slain. And the last little bit of worship. Because he sits on the throne? Because he sits on the throne. Because he is the, the ruler. Right. Kind of summing up all the other previous worships. And the four living creatures say, Amen. Amen. Yeah, he's Alright. We'll get into the sealed judgments next time we meet, which I believe is next week, yeah. We don't have anything yeah. that would prevent us from meeting next oh, week. Oh, no. Okay. Why? What? Stop that. So, <laughs> we need brown nun. We'll get to our first uh, non chronological par- parenthetical insertion or lunch break or uh, parentheses. Yeehaw! And we'll look at the. So, what are we doing for next time? Seven, seven, or just six? Six through eight, five.